Hi, I'm Scott Patton. I just want to thank you for watching our online service today. My goal is to give you an expeditionary journey through God's Word, through expository preaching. And when you get one of our sermons here, we're going to preach uh, based on the Holy Spirit of God's inspired words, the good, the bad, the ugly. Some things you might like and the Holy Spirit is going to inspire you and some things he's probably going to convict you on. Nonetheless, we're honored that you watch us today. God bless you and go bold. Please open up the Word of God today. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. You all have seen up to this point, the first four chapters in this beautiful epistle, uh, uh, Peter is, is going bold and he's telling a, a, a great exposition on how we're not to conform to this world but conform to the kingdom of God. And during this time, you have seen his target audience for this is, has been the individual Christian. So Peter has been painstakingly going through the, that saying that the culture war that they're seeing in Rome was ground zero for the souls of mankind. And spiritual war it is. It's amazing how you see the similarities today. The kingdom of God and what you're going to see also, that sometimes what we see as an asset in the world is a liability in God's kingdom. And sometimes what we see as <coughs> a liability in God's kingdom is actually an asset. But as you saw last week, <coughs> Peter made a bold and audacious shift. He put the onus on the leaders of the church and the shepherds. And he is pointing out one of the greatest assets that we will all have in this world is a thing called humility. And with that, I'm going to read God's word. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, <coughs> but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, and casting all your care upon him, he cares for you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for this service, Lord. And Lord, I just pray on this day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit of God will give me the words from God and not Scott. I pray, Lord, that everybody who hears your word today, when I say, thus saith the Lord, leaves here a different person than the person that came in here today. I thank you so much for this congregation. We have a lot of petitions we're making to you, God, and we know that they will be answered. And Father, we thank you and we praise you. And all God's people said, thank you. Okay, we're going to go right back. Uh, we're going to go right back to, to uh, verse 5 here as I read God's word again. Likewise, you young, younger people, submit yourself to your elders Yes, you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself to the elders. Have you noticed how Satan likes to sometimes in churches? I've never seen this in this church, and I've, 
I've, uh, you know, when I was a member here since 2007, I believe, uh, and since I've been the pastor, sometimes Satan will use an elderly versus the young generation uh, war inside a church. And you see that in churches across, across the country sometimes. And the only time I've really seen this in our church is when you have the, the pre-menopause ladies versus the post-menopause ladies with the, with the, with the air conditioning, okay, or the heater. I'm going to tell you right now, you will have some fights, okay, because I see some ladies will tell me, you sitting there like this, and I'll have the other ladies over here going like this, and so that's why the preacher doesn't get involved in the temperature of the church. Can I get an amen? Even though I should know the temperature of the church, that's why it's Caleb's job. So if you have a problem, you have a problem, you have a problem with the, the ladies, if you have a problem if it's too hot in here, or some of you ladies if it's too cold, that's, it. that's on Caleb, all right? All right. So, but, but in all seriousness, typically what you see in churches sometimes, it's about, it's about uh, uh, music and preaching. And, and, and I'm not saying, guys, every Sunday should be like False Creek, okay? But there's a lot of things we can do uh, that, that we can do for our youth, absolutely. And I'll tell you guys, on Wednesday night, if you ever come to one of our services with our kids, I preach, I preach. I don't do anything else. I get out the Bible, uh, there's, uh, but I will do some other things uh, that's a little bit different, okay? Because I've got to be interactive with the kids uh, than, than, than I am, and we have a back and forth. And usually I have the kettlebells out, and we do some exercises. And, and, but, but, but here's the thing. I must be as doctrinally correct with the kids on Wednesday night as I am with you. Can I get an amen? This is how we have to do it. We have to be doctrinally correct in the fundamentals of the Bible. And I preach the same Bible word by word, verse by verse. But I want you to notice this, what he's Peter saying here, and this, 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 this next word here. Clothed, clothed with humility. There are so many messages, guys, that, that we can apply to our lives today and apply uh, to, to, to what Peter is saying here. But the first one I want to point out here in Scripture is, what I think if Peter was sitting here, right here, this is what I think he would tell us. Uh, this is what I think he would tell us. You guys remember Adam and Eve uh, when they were guilty of their first sin. Do you remember what they did? They ran up and they, all, they covered themselves, right? They were guilty. They were naked. They were ashamed. They were in the garden, okay? And they covered themselves. And then God, in His mercy, gave them what? He gave them animals. He gave the animal skins to cover themselves so they wouldn't be so they wouldn't be ashamed and they could cover their shame. And if you think about that first, that was one of the first acts of redemption that God shown. And it's a wonderful sense of redemption. And it kind of, if you think about it, 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 it foreshadowed, it foreshadowed the, the, uh, the ultimate act of Christ Jesus, who someday would clothe us with his righteousness. Now I want you to think about this. So when Peter says, clothed with humility, he's referring to the Old Testament times when people used, used sackcloth and ashes. Now, what's a sackcloth? It's basically a burlap sack. You know, that's you get your old feed stuff in, your, your corn and, and, your, and your grain, okay? And what they would do back in, in biblical times, back in the Old Testament times, they would cover themselves in these, in these, these sackcloths and, and ashes, okay, as a time of repentance, when God's people would dress themselves there. Man, I'm glad we don't have to do that today because uh, I'd be in the sackcloth and ashes all the time. But, but it's a public sign of repentance and humility before God. Now, I want you to understand this. When Jonah, you guys remember back in, in the book of Jonah, when he declared to the people of Nineveh that God was going to destroy uh, them for their wickedness. And everybody in Nineveh, everybody, everybody from the king on down responded with repentance, fasting, clothed in sackcloth and ashes, Jonah 3, 5, 7. So I think it's amazing here because I'll tell you today in America, we need to similarly respond to the warnings of Nineveh. We need a humbling change in the church of God here in America. You see, remember in the story in, 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 in Jonah, God saw a change in the people of Nineveh, and a humbled heart it changed their hearts, and it, it was represented by sackcloth and ashes, and it caused him to do what? He relented. So don't tell me that we can't pray and change things in God's eyes. We can't. 
we can't, we can't pray and change things in God's eyes because he relented on his plan and he decided not to destroy Nineveh like he had planned to. So in the context, we don't have to wear sackcloth today and ashes, but we need to be, uh, we need to be clothed with an outward appearance of humility. Because I'll tell you all, humility is the most powerful trait we have as Christians. It hands down, it is. And a lot of times it's, 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 it's confusing. It's one of those confusing traits in the Christian life because sometimes, sometimes, guys, here's what happens. We view this being humble as being wrong or being weak. And that's not, that's not anywhere close to what God means by being humble. You guys know that one of the the, the um, one of my favorite quotes of all time is those who live by the sword okay that's how it goes those who live by the sword tend to get shot by those who don't can I get an amen that's what happens hey, you fell for it Don oh it's so good I know that's alright but here's the deal here's the deal because we sometimes we, if we're going to live and die by the sword okay you've got to be humble You've got to be humble, but you see, that's what happens a lot of times. You see the narcissism that, that's in our society today. The greatest barrier, I believe, to, to people uh, coming to Christ and accepting the Christ is having the humility to say yes to Jesus. Having the humility. Pride is always getting in the way. There's nothing in this world that will disarm your enemies more than a humble servant of Jesus. Can I get an amen? It will disarm Satan every time. Very simply, a sackcloth with ashes. Clothed in humility. Where the outward sign of the inward condition. Such a symbol made a change in someone's heart and demonstrated sincerity to one's grief and one's repentance. I'll tell you guys, we will never have revival in our church or you will never have revival in your family okay, without humility. If my people are called by my name, we will humble ourselves and pray and seek my face from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive them of their sin and heal their land. Second Chronicles 7, 14. But notice this next phrase. Notice this next phrase here. For God resist the proud. For God resists the proud. Now, if you guys don't get anything that I preach here all summer, I want you to remember this. I want you to remember this. God hates arrogance. He hates it. He absolutely hates arrogance. And it is so profound in the Bible. That is a trait that God despises. If you don't get anything I preach in the next month, understand this. God will make your life miserable if you are proud. He will. I'm just telling you, he hates the narcissist. He hates the, the, the narcissist society that he sees right now. And I'll tell you, most of the time, these narcissist people, they're usually the most miserable people in society. The most arrogant are the most people. Now, you see the people in Hollywood, they're narcissists, they're arrogant. You see the liberal Marxist uh, politicians and their narcissism. It's all about me. It's all about them. But you also see how miserable they are. You also see them with all kinds of relationship problems. You see them with all kinds of addictions. Okay? And what's amazing to me is we, we look at this, and we look at this as society, and we're always trying to conform like these people that are narcissists. And what, what, what Peter's saying is, God resists the proud. People that are most arrogant are the most miserable. As a Christian, I'm gonna just going to tell you guys, you may be at a point in your life where you're struggling and God's not using you because there's a good chance that pride, your individual pride, is getting in your way from be fulfilling God's purpose. It's your arrogance and your hubris. I'm just going to tell you guys that. We all struggle with this. And you can't say that you don't. Because I do. Sometimes people like to call this karma. Not, not me. It's not karma. That's not karma. That's God. You know why? Because God hates prideful people. He hates the sin of pride. He hates arrogance. 
we all need to look in the mirror to include me. Because I want you to understand this. It was pride that took the most beautiful, powerful angel in the universe ever created named Lucifer, and pride turned him into a devil named Satan. Why does God hate the pride? That's the first example right there. Why does he hate the pride? I'm going to tell you guys, I'm getting so dang mad right now when the whole month is dedicated to this, this gay pride month. I'll just tell you right now, it's making me sick. But I'm going to tell you who's making sick. It's making God sick. Because that was God's symbol. It wasn't the gay pride symbol. That was God's symbol. And, the, and, and, the, and, the, and, and the Satan has hijacked it. He has absolutely hijacked God's symbol. God made this covenant with the rainbow as a token. He made a covenant with his people. The waters of the flood receded. Noah and my family, they, exa- they, 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 they exited the ark. And what did God say? You remember what he said? He said, I established my covenant with you. God said that. I established my covenant with you, and never again will life be destroyed by the waters of flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So what God do? He made a beautiful rainbow. That was God's signal. Nobody else's. You can't take away from that from God. That's God's sign. Since Noah walked out of that ark. That was God's sign. And I'll tell you guys, it makes me sick. It absolutely makes me sick that everybody has taken this from God. We have these special interests of mocking God. Do that at your own pride. Because here's the thing. The meaning of pride, this is what the dictionary says, it's an unreasonable feeling of superiority. It's one's talents, beauty, wealth, rank, they, 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 they have no need for God because they think they're, well, we're, so, we're so proudful of everything else. I could be totally self-reliant, look down to others to feel like one is entitled to certain things because of something they've been doing. It's haughty behavior. I'm going to tell you guys, you guys know I've talked about this in the pulpit. A lot of Baptist preachers are talking about this in the pulpit right now, but the sexual assault report that came out with the Southern Baptist Convention several months ago, or several, I'm sorry, last week. Do you know why we've lost 1.1 members, million members in the last two years? I'll tell you why. It's because of pride. I'm just going to tell you. The Southern Baptist Convention, who we co-op, used to co-op with, we got too big, they got too powerful, and they started looking at the culture and their pride, and they started acting like the culture. And this is what I saw, in the, and when I read the report, and it said sexual assault report, the, the biggest entity of the abusers came from the North American Mission Board. And you know what the budget was last year? It was $485 million. You can't tell me that doesn't coincide with the pride that we're seeing today. And I believe that you're going to see, with all the lawsuits and the things that are coming, you're going to see some long-term damages. You know Why? Because God hates arrogance and he hates pride. He hates it. But I want you to look at verse 6. Let's go to the next verse, Caleb. Therefore, what's it there, therefore? (laughs) Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Under the mighty hand of God. I love that submission and that submission to an act of faith. We are trusting that God's hand will direct our lives with his purpose, not Scott's. Not JD's, not, but God's purpose. Because here's the thing, guys. God will not take advantage of you. No, he won't take advantage of you. But the people in our culture will. But the mighty hand of God directs our lives if we humbly let him. David. Remember that? Remember David? Story of David. God told David he would be king. But what? remember what happened? King saw his father-in-law hunted him down like a dog for four years and tried to kill him. And David remained vulnerable the whole time. But he knew God was going to protect him. He didn't concern himself with everybody saying, David, you're crazy. You need to fight back. You need to fight back. You need to fight back. He said, no, I'm not questioning God. You remember that time when David had the opportunity to kill Saul? When Saul decided he would use the bathroom in the cave that David was hiding? 
and David was hiding right behind him. When Saul came in there to use the bathroom, he never saw David. Remember what David did? Instead of killing him, he cut off a piece of his robe, and he stuck it in his pocket. He kept it. He could have killed Saul right then, but David chose not to. You see, he didn't give in to the concern of people seeing his weakness because everybody said, oh, David, you're being weak. You're being weak. He had the humility. He knew he was going to have the mighty hand of God protect him. And he had, that's what he did, the mighty hand of God. And after four years, what happened? David would become king. Can I get an amen? And he did that without sinning. You know, he'd sin later with Bathsheba, but not at this point. But notice what he says here. Exalt you in due time. Now think about this, guys. And I want you guys to remember this. God never exalts anyone until they're ready on God's time. You know, I, I look at my life. I was never ready to preach when I was 25 years old or 30. I was 50 years old before God called me to preach. It was on God's time. Brother Heath, for example, he was about 30, right? When God called him a preacher, 25, 25, 24, a lot younger than me, <laughs> I'll tell you that. But you see, that was, he, God exalted Heath and his time. He exalted me on my time. You see what I'm saying? God will exalt you on your own time, on your own time. But here's what happens, guys. We get impatient. And we want things instantly. Always remember, and I want you guys to consider this. There's a cross and there, there's a crown. You hear what I said? There's a cross, and then there's a crown. The cross is suffering, but the crown is glorious. Can I get an amen? And this is what happened to Jesus, but he expects the same thing in our lives. We're going to have suffering. We're going to have suffering before we get to the crown. Moses was under the powerful hand of God for 40 years. 40 years, Moses was, was lost in the desert, working for his father-in-law as a nasty shepherd for 40 years. And then when he was 80 years old, God said, okay, it's time, Moses. It's time, Moses. And he, gave, he made Moses the most powerful human being that's ever walked the face of the earth. And you remember what Moses did? He walked into Pharaoh's court and he said, let my people go. Now, I want you to understand, at that time, Pharaoh was more powerful than the president of the United States, and Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world. Imagine somebody walking into the White House and saying, let my people go today. This is, this is how you equivalent. But Moses, he gave Moses that power. He went to the cross, and then he went to the crown. Joseph, under the hand of God. Remember Joseph, he was falsely accused of sexual adultery, and he suffered for 13 years. Then the powerful hand of God lifted him up to the throne. He mocks the mockers, but shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. Proverbs 3.34. But look at the next verse. Look at verse 7 here. Verse 7. Casting all your care upon him. Isn't it amazing? You guys remember what Peter was before he met Jesus? What was his job? He's a fisherman, right? And he caught fish right there. That's where you used to catch fish, right in the mouth. Can I get an amen? That's the best place to catch fish. I'll tell you. Somebody asked me, where did you catch all the fish? I said, right there in the mouth. He was a gigantic fisherman. And Peter's saying, Jesus is casting a gigantic net. And he's capturing all your cares. Did you see what it says there? Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, I want you to understand this. One of the many benefits of this relationship we have with God is the privilege of taking every single bit of our burdens. Did you know the word care translated from Greek means anxiety? We have anxiety today in our lives. I have anxiety right now for my brother Darren. And this verse is for him right now. Did you know the word care translated Greek means anxiety? But what Peter's saying is, cast that net. Let me have it. Let God have it. Because sometimes uh, th th these, these wise, humble choices of giving God our burdens, he'll cast them away. He'll take them. But we have to have the humble and the humility to do this. 
When pride comes before disgrace, but humility comes with wisdom. That's Proverbs 11, 2. And in closing, I'm going to tell you guys as we close this sermon. If anyone has ever lived in the world that knew from experience that God cares for his own, it would be Peter. To, to tell you, when you read and you understand the four Gospels, you're going to find that the Apostle Peter shared in some of the greatest miracles ever performed on earth. But Jesus, but look, look what Jesus did for Peter. Peter had a hard time, but look what he did. Peter healed his mother-in-law. He gave a great catch of fish with a large net. Do you remember when Peter uh, paid the, the temple tax? Do you remember when Peter was walking on water and then, uh, and then he, he lacked faith for a little bit and he started drowning and remember who, who picked him up? Do you remember it was Jesus that healed the, the ear when Peter cut off the guard's ear? Acts 12 said he rescued Peter from a torch's jail. And here's what I will tell you all. Here's what I will tell you all today. Cast thy burden upon the Lord and he will sustain thee. Psalms 55.3 Cast your burden upon the Lord, and He will sustain you. How does God show His love for us and care for us? When we humbly give our love, our loyalty, and our burdens to Him. All of them. First, He will give us courage to fight daily and not to run away. Second, He will give us wisdom. Third, He will give us strength. And finally, he gives us faith. With every head bowed and all eyes closed. Father, we thank you for our service today. I thank you for everybody here. Father, I just, I just ask that you would surround us with your most powerful angels. And if somebody that's watching online today uh, does not know you, have them send me a text. I'll call you and I'll share the gospel with you. Father, I pray for False Creek this week that, that if we just get one in the gate and I ask the church to fully support False Creek with your prayers this week. And Father, we just thank you and we love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand.